Calvary. Uh, the last few weeks, my family and I spent in a village in central Cote d'Ivoire working with a Bible translation project in the Moi language. So I wanted some of the translators that have been working on getting the Bible in their language for the first time to read the passages this morning. Now, we said it was the I do not ask for these only but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Beite, que Jésus est ma bene odi. Que yapele oni do. Wama, gloria, pena, ni la flepe que treta. Kage, clen, pen yi. Mwenta, be ka o kle, an klana ne, moule. Ka o mi fe yiba, ko de wama peke akbe. Be li wenge, to yi. Be mi ka mou danan. Jan o jan, mou lale. Ka o dan, mou kwen, ta ta o lele. Ka nyango do, nyo ka ba yi kwen se ta. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, to the end of the age. Be come on, ya gloria, strawle. Kebe, cla, canu cre, unstrale, keka, mi ba, jao, Jerusalem. Why pegay, zude? Be samari clem way. Kebe, tene, dunia, dama, mema. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Isn't that neat? I, uh, this morning, <clears throat> excuse me, I get kind of emotional watching stuff like that. I don't know about you. This morning I was, I was in my study and I counted um, 16 different Bibles <laughs> sitting on the, uh, the shelf right there in front of me. And I think I have probably eight or nine more here in my office at church. And I thought, man, they've got the New Testament now in their language, thanks to the work of Wycliffe Bible translators, guys like Jack. Isn't that exciting? And uh, where did Jack start? And where did he grow up? Anywhere near here? <laughs> Why is this all possible? Well, it's because missions is within reach. It is. And we've been looking this month at that idea of missions being within reach. We've introduced you to a lot of our uh, global partners, some right here in the area, uh, some like the Haymans who came last week who have been in Slovakia. Um, but I wanted to finish this month by looking just at some passages here in Scripture that show us that missions is indeed within reach to us. So I started thinking through this. Uh, one of the things I enjoy doing, I love reading. Reading is one of my favorites. And um, I enjoy reading um, missionary biographies. And God called to mind uh, the story of Gladys Aylward. I don't know how many of you know the story of Gladys Aylward. She was a uh, British uh, housemaid uh, living in the early 1900s. Um, and hearing of the need for the gospel in China, she was impressed that that was what God wanted her to do, what he wanted her to give her life to. So she applied to the China Inland Mission. That's the uh, missions organization started by Hudson Taylor, that great missionary to China. And she applied there, um, went through three months of training, 
And after three months of training, she was dismissed uh, because she wasn't uh, acquiring the language to a degree that they felt like she was fit for missions in China. So they released her and said, we're sorry, we just don't really think you're qualified for the work of missions in China. Um, but Gladys was undaunted. She went back to her uh, work as a housemaid, but the, mission, the burden for the, the mission to China never really left her heart. She heard of a lady named Jeannie Lawson, um, an older lady who was working alone in a remote region of China, and she felt very much compelled that that's where God wanted her to minister. So she gathered up her life savings and bought a one-way ticket across um, Siberia on the railway there, the tri Trans-Siberian Railway, um, across Siberia, Russia, uh, hoping to enter China from the north there and connect with uh, Jeannie Lawson. Um, as she neared the end of her journey there across Siberia, she came into basically a war zone where there was fighting going on between Russia and China, and the train was halted, said it wasn't going to be going any further. Uh, so she had to get off the train and kind of figure out what's next. Uh, she was actually nearly conscripted into the Russian army because they asked her what her occupation was, and she responded that she was a missionary, but they thought she said machinist. And so, hoping that they could, you know, as they're retooling for war, they thought they could put her to work. She almost got put into the Russian army. Um, she was thankfully rescued, smuggled on a ship to Japan, and from there made her way to China and found her way to Jeannie Lawson and started to minister alongside her. They, they had opened up an inn um, where they would, along with hospitality, give the gospel to the drivers of the traveling mule trains that would come through taking their goods over the mountain passes. And um, through their ministry to those individuals and just to the people in the village there, uh, gained uh, really a remarkable reputation among the Chinese people. Um, Jeannie Lawson, not much later, uh, passed away, leaving Gladys to do the work of that ministry uh, alone. But such was her reputation there as one um, who, who uh, loved and um, really lived without uh, fear among the people that uh, the local Mandarin noticed that and actually put her in charge of visiting all the villages in the region as the official foot inspector. Because back at that time, there was a practice um, called foot binding, whereby the, the feet of young girls would be broken, bent, and then bound because they believed there was beauty in small feet. And the government had, bound, had banned this practice, but needed it to be enforced. And so they turned over uh, the, the work of that to Gladys Ilward. Um, she gained such a rapport within that work that when a, a, a riot broke out, in a notorious prison, the one that housed the most hardened criminals, they actually called Gladys to restore peace. Now, those things are uh, astounding in and of themselves, right? Okay. But um, with, the, with the onset of World War II as it was approaching, um, Gladys had already begun to take in orphans into the um, in that they were running there, but with the onset of World War II, the attacks of the Japanese on the Chinese, um, she began to take in many, many more. We finally reached a point where really living in the region was untenable. It was no longer safe. And so Gladys set out over the mountain passes with over 100 children, just her and 100 children, some of them infants, newborns, many of them young toddlers, and they traveled hundreds of miles over the mountain passes uh, to an area where it was safer before she collapsed of exhaustion. No wonder. All this for a woman who was told that she was unfit for missionary work in China. How? How is all this possible? It was possible because Gladys Aylward believed that missions was within reach. Why was missions within reach? Was it because she was naturally skilled? No. Educationally, she couldn't have been more unqualified. Was it because she had material means? No, she was a poor housemaid. Was it because of, because of China Inland Mission, who, if she would just work and scrimp and save, she could support so that others could be sent? No, she felt that missions was within reach for her. But how then? How is it possible for Gladys Aylward to find missions within reach for her? And Gladys believed that God had put missions within reach for her. 
And the same God that she served in the 1900s, early 1900s, is the same God that we serve today. Now, while I'm definitely not um, encouraging such a reckless approach to missions, if you have a heart stirring for that, we have avenues we can guide you through. Um, don't find yourself trekking across Siberia on your own, okay? I do believe, though, that there are three truths that Gladys believed that if we will lay hold on today, we will find missions to be within reach for ourselves as well. So I want us to look today at three truths from God's word, in fact, actually from the words, the teachings of Christ himself, that put missions within reach for each of us here. I want us to see that God's word, Christ's words, show us that missions is within reach for three reasons. And I want you to see the three that we're going to look at before we look at them individually. We're going to see from Christ's words that the will of God works through us, that the authority of God sends us, and that the power of God fills us. Again, we'll see today, through the words of Christ, that the will of God works through us, that the authority of God sends us, and that the power of God fills us. Before we get into our first point, I know we have prayed this morning. Let's take a quick word of prayer. I just want to ask for God's blessing as I speak, and then we'll look at these points. Father God, I thank you so much for your power and your presence. I thank you for the encouraging words of uh, many believers who even caught me this morning and, and told me of their prayers for me and what a blessing that is to, to my soul. I pray this morning that it would be, not be my words, but yours, that the precious words of our Savior Jesus Christ would reach our ears and find their way to our hearts, and that you would stir us to believe that missions is indeed within reach for each of us here today in some way, shape, or form uh, to your glory and for our joy and the joy of the nations because you are a great God. Lord, help us this morning merely to revel in who you are. We ask in your name, amen. Uh, first, why don't you turn to John chapter 17. John chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. John chapter 17, verses 20 and 21 says this. It says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now, this passage right here, John chapter 17, verses 20 and 21, comes in the midst of what we call Jesus' high priestly prayer. He's about to go to the cross, and he's praying over his disciples as a high priest intercedes on behalf of God's people. Now, a few verses earlier in this prayer, he had made statements such as in verse 15, where he says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Now, this may simply give us a sense of, uh, of holy living, that we would be a light in darkness, which, of course, we, we are to be. And yet, another phrase from this prayer gives further clarity to God's will for us when Jesus prays in verse 18 of this passage, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. So we, we kind of have a couple statements made here by Christ. On the one hand, he says, I, I pray that you will not take them out of the world, but that you will leave them in the world, but that you will protect them from the evil one, keep them from Satan's uh, attacks and from the world system that would draw us away. He prays protection. But it's not just for a sense of holy living because he says, uh, I, I'm not just gonna kind of call them out of the world to live holy and separate, but no, I'm sending them into the world. So we're, we're, we're left here, but we're also sent. Uh, sent to do what? Why are we left in the world? Why are we sent in the world? Well, that leads us to what he says here in our passage in verses 20 and 21. And as we look at these two verses, I want you to see just two things as a part of this first point, that it is God's will to work through us. First, that it is God's will to save. We are backed in our work of reaching the world with this knowledge that it is God's will to save. He says in verse 20, I pray not only for these only, that was those right there gathered around him, his disciples, but also I pray for those who will believe in me. 
There were those who would believe in him because it was God's will to save. He also says at the end of verse 21 that they may believe in me. So there were those who he knew would, be, would believe because it was his will to save them. This is why Jesus could say that we were left in the world, sent in the world, because it was the will of the Father to save. You see, earlier in Jesus' ministry, early in his public ministry, he said this, and it's recorded in John chapter 6, verse 37, all that the Father gives to me will come to me. All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. As we consider missions within reach, isn't that word will encouraging? Isn't that word will empowering? That there are those who will believe in me? And that those who the Father gives to me will come to me, especially when we look down the road into Revelation, where it's recorded in chapter 7, verse 9, that there are people from every tribe, nation, people, tongue, who will be gathered around God's throne. It is God's will to save, and this truth can give us confidence that missions is within reach. But also from these two verses, I want you to see that not only is it God's will to save, but it's God's will to speak through us. He says there in verse 20, what? He says, they will believe through their word. Here he speaks over his disciples and he says, I pray not only for these only, but those who will believe and they will believe through their word. His intention was for them to take the gospel out and that was how he was gonna reach those who he willed to save. In verse 21, it also goes on and talks about this, this unifying work of the Father and the Son with those who are drawn to faith in him, where he says, he says there in that verse that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. And when he gives the, the, the reason for why this may be, why he prays this so earnestly, he says, so that as you are in me and I am in you and these who believe are, are in us and we all dwell in unity together, his, his desire is that the world may believe that you have sent me. You see, we see the unity of believers with Christ and one another accompanied by our witness to the truth and God's will to save. And when we consider all these things together, there should be no doubt, looking at Jesus' words here, that missions is indeed within reach. Amen. Secondly, I want you to consider next that missions is not only within reach because of the will of God working through us, but also because the authority of God sends us. If you would, turn over to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, very familiar uh, passage to us. We refer to it as the Great Commission. <clears throat> Here in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, it says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus says here, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, my, my students have heard me say this countless times. Uh, I think my sixth graders, if there's any of them in here, especially recently have heard me say this about the word all. You all know the phrase, right? All means all, and that's all, all means. <laughs> that's kind of a silly little saying, but not so much, right? It, it leaves nothing uncovered, all. There's no limit here to the scope of his authority. It's not some authority has been given to me. It's not a lot of authority has been given to me. But he says here, all authority has been given to me. There's no limit to the scope. He also says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. In essence, no realm is left out from under his authority. Whether it be the material, the physical, the earthly, or whether it's the spiritual, the heavenly, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. But think of some of the examples we see of this authority when we when we look at his life recorded in scripture. What about calming the sea, right? Where the disciples, able fishermen, 
very familiar with the Sea of Galilee or on the boat and it's being swamped to the point that they're afraid that they're gonna die and they say, Lord, do you not care that we're perishing? And he stands up and he simply says to the wind and the waves, peace, be still. And it obeys. Why? Because he not only had great power of might but of authority. These were the winds and waves that he had created. They bowed to their master. Or how about when Jesus comes to um, the far side of the Sea of Galilee and meets there a man coming out of the graves who had been possessed by demons. And what is it that the demons recognize right away? They recognize the authority of Christ. They recognize who he is. And when he says to them, be cast out of the man, and they say, can we at least go into this herd of swine? And he commands, and that's where they go. And there, there was no sense within that whole story that they were not under his power and authority. Whatever he said, they did. They recognized his authority from beginning to end. So we see his, his power, his authority over the created order. We see his power over the spiritual realm. Or how about this? When he stands before the tomb of a dear friend, Lazarus, and those around him weep over that loss, even Jesus himself does. But what does he say? He says, he says, move the stone away. And he calls out to Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. Remember, he'd been dead for days. Even, even his sister said, why, why are you opening the tomb? He's gonna stink, he's rotting, he's decaying. But he calls out, Lazarus, come forth. And he comes forth. Jesus has authoritative power, even over life and death. In fact, let this meditation culminate in remembering that Jesus says this, having gone from the garden to the cross, into the grave, from death unto life in the resurrection. He has conquered sin and death so that he reigns over all things. We should probably even note here in this passage that it says, Jesus himself says, all authority is given to me, right? All authority is given to me. Who? By whom? By the Father. There's unquestionable authority at play here. Sorry, pause. I got loose from my headset there for a moment. It was either keep speaking or have that thing bore a hole straight through the back part of my jaw. I'm willing to pay the price for preaching the gospel, but not that right there. <laughs> okay, what does this mean for us? What does it mean to have a savior who has all authority in heaven, on earth, given to him by the Father, so that when we look at that authority, this is the Father of Jesus Christ, our Savior, the Son, and God the Father, the, the, the creator and ruler of the entire universe. He says then in verse 19 then, go therefore, go. Don't those, if we contemplate that kind of authority, don't those words ring with power? In fact, he says, go therefore. In other words, on everything Christ had just said, that all authority was given to him in heaven and earth, he says, go. He sends us in the power and authority of his name. There's really very little to wrap our minds here, around here. It's, it's very simple. Go. This is the command of a sovereign. We can't glory in the sovereign as we just did in our time of worship, and then balk at his commands. So I thought about this. I thought of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, 5, verses 18 through 20. It says there in those verses, all this, he'd been talking about uh, the, the new creation through the gospel of Jesus Christ, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. I mean, did you see that there? We've got this glorious message to take to the world that people can be reconciled to God. Our sins have separated us from him. We've been living as people separated from God from the very beginning when we rebelled against him. And yet we have this wonderful message that through Jesus Christ, we can be reconciled in our relationship to the very God of the universe. And he says here, I've got this message and I'm giving it to you. Now you take this ministry of, the, of, of this word of reconciliation and take it. So he actually says there in that passage of verse 20, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal 
through us. We implore you, this is what we implore the world to on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. I got thinking about this idea of being an ambassador for Christ. I don't know how many of you are like me and really, really, really love the Olympics. Anybody out there like that where you just love the Olympics? Here's one of the blessings of my marriage. My wife loves the Olympics. Like we both kind of get geeked out when it's an Olympic year, right? And it doesn't matter if it's winter where the United States doesn't win as much or the summer where we kind of dominate. We just love it. There's something about the Olympics which just captivates us. Now, the opening ceremonies are weird. They're really, really weird. I think it's like an every four year contest to see who can do it weirder than the other hosts. But my, I think actually one of my favorite moments is then like the, the parade of nations, right? Where they all come in. Do any of you get like just, and it goes on forever, okay? But it's so cool to like see these like nations come in and um, you know, they've got on like the, the, like the garb of their country, their culture, and some are very, very large contingencies. But I sometimes love the small ones, you know, where there's like one athlete and then seven Olympic committee representatives from their country. And you're like, oh, this is cool. This country has eight. I didn't even know there were eight people in that country. And then and they find out, and one of them is an athlete. But that person with that garb on and their country's flag doesn't joy just radiate from them? They are so proud in that moment. And I think there's a sense that they're like proud in that moment um, because they've made it. Their, their, their work that they've done of reaching the Olympics has come to fruition. But there's an immense pride in representing their people and their culture to where they just say, I want the world to know who we are. They're, they're basically, they, I think even in the Olympics, they turn them good, kind of like goodwill ambassadors. But I thought there's, there's kind of actually other way of looking at ourselves as ambassadors as well, okay? Um, you know, we, we live in a world of conflict. Right now, there's a great amount of conflict in our world. And I thought, you know, some of those nations, as much as they're very proud of who they are and their culture, which is unbelievably great, you know, if they were to show up at the doorstep of a world superpower and say, you better stop, they might say, now remind me where you're from. Who are you again? Okay, so think about it. Now, I don't want to offend any nations out there, okay? Okay, not, not looking to offend any nations. But quite frankly, a superpower like China doesn't tremble on their knees before Equatorial Guinea. I think that's a country, right? Somebody look at that. Somebody Google that for me real fast, okay? And I don't know if you're following what I'm saying here, but like the ambassador from that country shows up and they, they represent them and there's a power behind them that's not their own. They represent that country. But what happens when you show up as the ambassador of a world superpower? Now, the, the ambassador themselves is just a person, but what do they represent? They represent great power and great authority. So that when they say, hey, we, we had talk about this. This has got to stop. People listen. Right? Well, think about this. Think about both aspects of what it means then to be an ambassador. On the one, heart, on the one point, hopefully, we, we radiate with the glory of the kingdom that we represent as ambassadors of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we speak with authority because it's not our authority, it's the authority of God. All power, all power of authority in heaven and on earth. We can have great confidence that missions is within reach because the authority of God sends us. Now, see one more thing here this morning that, um, that the, the will of God works through us and the authority of God sends us. But lastly, that the power of God fills us. And turn to Acts chapter one, verse eight. Acts chapter one, verse eight. Again, a very familiar verse, but here again, the, these are the words of Christ, each of these. And he says here in Acts chapter one, verse eight, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, we might be tempted to think that it's great that Christ's authority is behind us, and that God wills to save using our word of testimony. But it still seems so overwhelming. We might still see so much in ourselves that falls short. 
Or perhaps we look within and we see fear and trembling. But in this passage, we are told that when we look within, we see something greater than our own strength, greater than our weaknesses. We see God himself. Jesus had already told his disciples in verse four of Acts chapter one that they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But now he repeats his promise of the Spirit and his indwelling and connects it to a very specific purpose. He says here, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, I I got to discuss this a little bit with um, one of the greatest Greek scholars that I know. Um, In fact, my Greek instructor when I was a freshman, sophomore in high school, um, Trevor Gearhart. And um, true story, by the way. And lots of other stories to go with it. We're discussing just various aspects of even the Greek words here. The the fact that the Greek word that's used for authority back in Matthew 28 and even in the previous verse here in chapter 7 when he says the father is fixed by his own authority is the word exousē, which is the power of um, of authority, um, the power of right. Here though in Acts chapter 1-8 we have the word dunamis, which is the power of might or you might think the power of enablement. So think about that. When he proclaims his power over us to be his witnesses, he gives us both his power of right and authority, but he gives us his power of might and enablement. And why? He says, you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here on this third point, but please notice the thread that we've seen throughout these passages. John 17, they will believe through their word. Matthew 28, go make disciples, be my witnesses, he says. Acts 1, you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Again, that word will is really important. You see, I think to Christ, it was a foregone conclusion. Jesus did not give the Holy Spirit to us with any expectation other than that we would be witnesses to the gospel. Yes, he gives us his his power for righteous living. I guess he gives us his, his power to endure great things, but he gives us his power here in Acts chapter 1 and 8, first and foremost, so that we would be witnesses to the gospel of truth, the salvation through him. So my question for you is, is this, as you contemplate these verses, ask yourself this question. Can we really say that missions is out of reach? If we consider the filling power of God, the authoritative power of God, the saving power of God, the willing power of God, can we in any way say that the, that the work of missions is out of reach? Now, you might be tempted to answer, no, it's, it's clearly within reach. I mean, look at, look at Jack Campbell that we saw up here today. In fact, one of our goals within Missions Emphasis Month is to introduce you to those with what I would call here maybe a a Gladys Aylward perspective, who believed that missions was in reach for them and are now our ministry partners today because of it. I I think of people like like Don Holmes. Many of you know Don Holmes from his early days when he was here at Calvary riding the buses. I mean, what... Now he's been laboring for decades down in, in Mexico, and, and I think, you know, I don't think Don himself at that point would have thought that a life of ministry in Mexico was within reach to him. Why was ministry within reach to Don and Susan Holmes? Because of themselves? No. Because of this God. And think of Jack Campbell. They're in, they're in Africa. Is it just because Jack Campbell has a skill at acquiring and learning languages? No, missions was in, within reach for Jack because of God. Think of Jeff Waller. We heard from the Mexico Bags Project this morning. And I was just reading uh, Jeff's most recent uh, prayer letter. And he talked about how he got connected to the child evangelism work that he does down there in San Angelo, Texas. And, and there was really a time where uh, he, he wasn't thinking that would be his life's calling. And yet the opportunity came up. The need for leadership was there. And he thought, you know, maybe this is something I can do. Again, why? Because because Jeff Waller himself was something great? No, because Jeff Waller's God is great. We can go on to others. Ray Badger out there in Copper Island seeking to reach the youth of the First Nations people. I'll I'll give you one to think about. About a few weeks ago at, at our 
members meeting when we heard from uh, Joe Hareen. I don't think Joe expected at this point to be the interim um, leader of ministry and more. I don't, I don't know, but wasn't it, wasn't it really great to see Joe, Dave Peevler, how about this, Joyce Craig, up there ministering? Why? Because just something through uh, providing, providing food, providing meals, providing things like that, they, just, they want people to hear the gospel. And they, they said, you know what, at this stage in our life, what, what, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna believe that missions is within reach for us, starting right here in our Jerusalem, in Bloomington Normal. So my question for you is this, will, will you consider how missions is within reach for you? I know we have missions partners. We have missions partners here in Bloomington Normal, in the United States, doing church planting and all sorts of other work around the globe as far, far flung as Bangladesh and Hong Kong, Cote d'Ivoire. My question is, is it, is it just them? I'm thankful for them, very much so. But is it also for you? I mean, you may not be the one to go overseas, although, maybe, I'm not here to play the Holy Spirit. Where does this kind of leading come from? Let me encourage you. It comes through prayer, meditation on him, opening up your heart and your life to him to ask what his calling might be on your life, and then seeing what kind of burden he stirs within you. I mean, as Abby testified this morning 20 years ago, it was just, it was women who wanted kids in Mexico to hear the gospel. And a burden was created, and they responded. And so now thousands of gifts flood in there every year with a gospel message accompanying them. What kind of burden might he play on your heart? My, my question is this, though. Will you do that? Will you prayerfully consider these passages here today and say, okay, God, I believe that it is your will to save and that, and that you speak through us. I believe that all authority has been given to you and you have said that based on that authority, we are to go. I believe that I don't have the power myself, but through your Holy Spirit's indwelling, I have your very power within me. What would it look like for CBC here to believe that missions is within reach? Because the will of God is over us, the authority of God is sending us, and the power of the Spirit is in us. It is within reach. Let's pray.